Welcome to the BS and Beer Show. Um, this is the first show in 2021, so you guys get to set the bar for 2021. Um, tonight's topic is Burbeck at Beacon Springs. Um, I'm Emily Mottram. For those of you who don't know, go back and watch the video we posted last year. I'm kidding. Um, I'm an architect here in Maine. Um, tonight, I am actually drinking tea made by Mike's fantastic wife. So having some hot tea here tonight. Um, we want to encourage other local groups to start your own BS and beer groups. This was started fundamentally when our local group couldn't meet in person anymore. Um, so we want to encourage you to get together with your local groups when you can, when it's safe to do so. Um, but there are several groups who have started their own online versions. Um, and if you're in an area and you're not sure if there's a group, reach out to one of us. The only thing that we ask is if you start your own group, don't trademark the name. Um, otherwise, we want to thank our media partners, Green Building Advisor and Fine Home Building for helping us put this show on and all of our fantastic guests who join us every week um, or show up and watch the replay. So thank you for joining us today. And it's off to you, Kylie. Thank you, Emily. Hello, everybody. I'm Kylie Jacques. I'm a senior editor at Green Building Advisor. I'm drinking peach tea tonight. Seemed like the right thing. Um, We've decided to not belabor the point on Zoom. I think everybody's pretty much got it at this point, but if you'd like to engage, do so in the chat box and just be sure to click on all attendees so we can see um, what you're contributing or asking. Um, Fine Home Building sends out reminders every week uh, about the show. And if you'd like more information delivered to your inbox, um, you can join the, uh, join the mailing list at thebsandbeershow.com or check out the weekly blog post that I put together at GBA. Um, tonight's show, we're going to have an interactive is the word that Michael used to describe it, and I'm looking forward to seeing what that means exactly. Uh, presentation by uh, architect Michael Clement, uh, followed by a panel discussion, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. We'll wrap up at 730. Uh, the video recording of tonight's show will be available at Green Building Advisor, and we encourage you to hop over there and continue the conversation. Um, and then we've also launched launched an audio only version of the show and that is available wherever podcasts are found. A couple of announcements on January 26th from 6 to 8 p.m. the uh, New York chapter of AIA will be hosting a webcast featuring four video conversations between designers and home builders who have completed lead for home and or passive house projects and it will be followed by a roundtable discussion moderated by Je uh, Zach Semke, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, I, I apologize, uh, of House, uh, Passive House Accelerator. And on February 2nd through the 4th, Efficiency Vermont will hold its annual conference, Better Buildings by Design. Emily and Mike are both presenting there this year, uh, and, the, and the theme will be Resilient Energy. And that's all I've got. Mike, you're going to introduce our guests. Yes, it's my honor to introduce our guests tonight. Uh, first, we have Michael Clement. He is the principal of Architectural Resource LLC, a full service award winning architectural design firm specializing exclusively in fine residential design of new homes, cottages, additions, remodels and renovations with an emphasis on smart, sustainable design. Their expertise ranges from historically sensitive to hyper contemporary to deep green to net zero energy and everything in between. Uh, Michael, do you have uh, anything to add to that? And most importantly, what are you drinking tonight? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I noticed someone commented about the bow tie. So uh, uh, I, I had, it's it's a signature piece. Kali was looking forward to it. I didn't want to disappoint her. So I'm excited to be here. It's actually a thrill to be part of the BS and Beer Show. You guys are making a, a big impact on our industry and we really appreciate that. And it's exciting for us to be able to share with you the Burbeck at Beacon Springs project. I am drinking water. <laughs> I I'll knew it. I knew you, you were that. <laughs> I'll leave it up to you to decide whether it's rainwater or not. And I'll, and we'll, we'll come back to that conversation at some point in the evening. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. I actually forgot to mention what I'm drinking. I'm drinking a Kushnock's, Kushnock Brewing Gigantic Dad Pants IPA, a New England style IPA brewed here in Augusta, Maine. Uh, our next guest is Amanda Webb. She is a registered architect and sustainability consultant who has built her career around building and development practices that save resources, 
reduce operating costs and increase occupant well-being and result in healthy internal environments and the preservation of external environments. She provides guidance and leadership to team members across all disciplines. Amanda, um, do you have anything to add? And do you have a beverage tonight? Um, I do have a beverage on the, the theme, it seemed. I have hot tea, um, <laughs> chamomile tonight for me. Um, and nothing to add really other than just my appreciation for you all hosting us and um, sharing this project with others. Or well, great, th thanks for, for j j joining us tonight. I do stutter, I'll lose, hopefully I'll loosen up a little here. Uh, last but certainly not least, um, everybody knows that projects don't happen without a builder. Uh, mm -hmm. Bob Burnside founded Fireside Home Construction in 1996, uh, building and remodeling custom homes with a focus on green building from the start. In addition to the project we're, we're discussing tonight, Fireside built Michigan's first LEED Platinum home, and they were named one of the top three builders in the country by Custom Home Magazine. Uh, Bob has a BS in marketing and an MBA, so he's a well-educated builder. Uh, Bob, what do you have to add, and, and do you have a beverage tonight? Well, I have a little Diet Coke here from the highway, which I know I shouldn't be drinking. I've been stressful driving on I-4 in Florida, but I'm here. And as soon as we're done with the stress of this conversation, it'll be Woodford Reserve. All right. Good choice. Good choice. Nice choice. I'm saving a little cocktail and a dinner for later. Uh, pleasure to be with you all. And I just can't say what a thrill it was to be part of this whole project. Uh, very difficult and challenging along the way. But uh, most of all, it's, it's really been a, a feather in our cap. Uh, I know Michael agrees with that and Amanda. Uh, but best of all, we've become very dear close friends with the owners, Tom and Marty. So it's been a win-win all the way and I'm happy to join you tonight. Excellent, thanks for being with us. Um, I lost my, I lost my uh, notes, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess, um, or yeah, Michael, do you want to uh, go go ahead and kick kick things off with your presentation? Then uh, give us the overview, and and then we'll we'll discuss it. Yes, absolutely. So when Kylie reached out to me and said, "Hey, we we'd like to do something on Burbeck at Beacon Springs," I thought excellent. But it, this, if there was ever a project that took a village to complete, this was it. And as I was mentioning to Kylie, Emily, and Mike before the show started the Amanda and Bob, the contribution that they made, this, this absolutely could not have happened without the synergy between these three, these other two key people. Uh, Amanda represented our Living Building Challenge ambassador and she was responsible for doing all of the vetting of the red list. And we're gonna talk more about that in this presentation. Uh, Bob obviously had to take all the crazy lines and numbers that we put on paper and turn it into something that was tangible and real. And as Bob said, and I think he said uh, when we were in the preamble to this, uh, Living Building Challenge is aptly named because it, this was a challenge for sure. I mean, there's, there's very likely a reason that as far as I know, there's only two certified residences on the planet that have met this certification goal. It is literally the outside extreme edges of the known green universe. <laughs> we blaze trails that we didn't even know there were trails. And, and it's gonna be exciting tonight to give you an overview. So what we wanted to do in this uh, first part of the evening together is give you a little synopsis about the project and talk about some of the motivations behind it. And then we'll, we'll circle back and answer questions from the panelists and the attendees. So I'm gonna to try to fire up PowerPoint presentation here. All right, so uh, Burbeck at Beacon Springs, uh, interesting name. The client's names are Tom and Marty Burbeck. Uh, interesting enough, B-U-R-B-E-C-K. And when we were starting the project, we were thinking like, we, we need to have a name, right? Any, any significant project needs to have its own identity. And so they spent some time thinking about it and they came up with this name Burbeck at Beacon Springs, which apparently in old English, and I don't know, so they can tell me anything and I would believe it, but it means dwelling by a creek. And as it turns out, there is a small seasonal creek on the property 
And the idea of Beacon Springs was they, they really, and we're going to share some of the sentiments that the clients shared with us, that they really wanted this to be something very, very special. They wanted this project to be a harbinger of new thought and kind of an, an epicenter of an opportunity for people to learn about what might be possible. So early on in the program, it's funny, uh, this will teach you to get an architect involved. I, I was meeting with Tom and Marty about remodeling their house. Next thing you know, <laughs> we're building a, a brand new living building challenge project. And uh, we were talking about green and certification programs because Tom and Marty are, uh, they're rebel rousers, they're you know, surfer hippies. I mean, they were very successful in their business, but they came from a very, uh, um, kind of troublemaking, shaking it up, uh, challenge the status quo background. And we were talking about certification programs. And I mentioned to them that there was this relatively new program called Living Building Challenge, and I had just learned about it. This was back in, I think, 2012 when everything got started. And so they did some research on it. And I'll remember distinctly being in the basement of Bob's home when we were having a charrette, because we were already anticipating going for LEED certification. And Bob, I'm sure you remember, Amanda, I'm sure you remember too, Tom stood up and literally threw the, the virtual gauntlet and said, we're going for living building challenge or nothing. And by that declaration, he put in place the machinery, the wheels that carried us through the next several years of process. And it was really, quite a challenging project. And you might want to ask, well, why would someone want to do a living building challenge project? And these are some of the things that influenced them. So you may be familiar with this image, Earthrise. That's when the astronauts first went around the far side of the moon and came back. And if they were to take that same trip today, they would see a planet that had 40% less ice when they came around that back side of the moon. I remember early on in, in the, the whole green movement back in 2006, a Time magazine suggesting that we might be concerned about uh, global climate change. Well, since then, we all know what's unfolded. Uh, one of the metrics of that is the, what they call the sea ice extent at the pole. And we're looking at the 1984, we look to September as the kind of the, the area that it recedes the most. That's September 1984, this is September 2020. And the opacity that you see is also showing the density of the ice pack. So not only is it shrinking, but its density is reducing as well. It, uh, it shocked me to learn that by 2030, they're projecting that Glacier National Park will actually be glacier free. We're looking at the work done by James Hansen, which you're, probably many of the viewers are familiar with, some may not be but he was studying Venus's atmosphere. And he took that same knowledge and understanding and he looked at the Earth's atmosphere. And he established that 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was the threshold beyond which we should not go. So what's been happening is we've been tapping into what we call ancient sunlight. And I love that description because oil represents 11 years of manual labor. And we've been able to do a lot of amazing things using this incredible resource but we've generated this, uh, what we're gonna know as the hydrocarbon age. And what we're looking at is a rapid acceleration of parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I just checked before this presentation and as of November of 2020, we are now at 413 parts per million. The last time that we were above 400 parts per million, humans didn't exist. Let's take a look at a broader picture of water because the Living Building Challenge program moves beyond the energy conversation and looks at many things and we're gonna discuss that. So we understand that upwards of three fourths of the water consumption in the US is due to the residential sector. So here's a kind of a pop quiz for all the participants in this event. True or false, water is the world's most abundant natural resource. Well, the answer, it's kind of a trick question. Um, yes and no. The water that we have on the planet, only two and a half percent of that is fresh water. And of that two and a half percent, roughly 70% is currently locked in glaciers and we're doing our level best to change that. 
30% in groundwater and 0.3% in lakes and rivers. So what does that mean? So we may consider the planet as being abundant source of water. But if you took all that water, which is a very, very, very thin layer, and if you compressed it into a sphere, that larger sphere you see would be all of the water on the planet, salt water, fresh water, everything. I'm gonna to go to a little different graphic here so you can see it a little bit better. That smaller sphere is all of the liquid fresh water. The third sphere, which is that little teeny dot, is the fresh water that's available in lakes and streams. And so here's it shown in yellow. So you really get a sense when you see the planet and you get this sense of this mass, vast amount of water, it really is very limited amounts of water. And that water is not being managed very properly. So this is a picture of Hoover Dam uh, back when it was first created. Hoover Dam and Lake Mead and Lake Powell generate a 20 million water supply for people in the Southwest USA. This is what it looks like today. What we're looking at is the changes that we've been creating is leading to a incredible change in terms of water in our aquifers. The Ogallala Aquifer, which is what was harvested to combat the dust bowls in the early part of the century, have been declining until we're now predicting, and you've probably noticed, we've been having dust storms in the Southwest. So the reason we're sharing this is to let you understand that we are looking at doing something much broader with a living building challenge project than simply being focused on energy. Energy is important, but not the only thing. The other thing we're looking at is waste. As we say, the ocean is downhill from everything. And I'm sure you're familiar with the, what is called the now the eighth continent, the North Pacific Gyre, where it's on average 30 meters thick of plastic junk. The rate of extinction, 58% decline, all, all natural living systems on this planet are in rapid decline. The amount of trash and waste that we generate in the building industry, 30 to 35% of our landfill is construction debris. So we're having a huge impact. The indoor environmental quality in our homes, two to five and on occasion 100 times higher in pollutants than outside air in one third of our buildings being toxic or deficient in ventilation. So the reason we're sharing all this with you is to help to set the stage for why we would consider pursuing living building challenge. And yes, building science is a piece of it, but it's not the entire piece. So we were certified under the living building challenge program 2.1. This was back in the 2018 when we first certified the project. What this is, is arguably one of the most rigorous green certification programs on the planet. Living Building Challenge is first a philosophy, second an advocacy, and third a building certification program. The concept is moving beyond merely bad to actually what does good look like? I mean, all of us on this call are engaged in doing better. This program says, what does really good look like? Not merely less versions of bad. I love this chart because it shows the trajectory from code to green, to high performance, to sustainable. But what Living Building Challenge does is focuses on that upper quadrant, which is moving into regenerative where our built form, our homes, what we create as an industry, which we up until now have pretty much accepted as transgressions on the natural environment, are actually catalysts and vehicles for change, for regenerating a positive environment. So that's what Living Building Challenge is. I mean, it's, it's so much more than lead or uh, passive house or, um, NAHB Green or, I mean, and these are all great programs and we've done many projects inside of those programs, but this is something that reaches far, far, far beyond that. 
and asked our clients to really reach into uh, new ways of thinking. So this is how the Living Building Challenge program is established. There are seven petals, which are place, water, energy, health and happiness, materials, equity, and beauty. And these are subdivided into 20 imperatives. We're gonna cycle back to this and Amanda's gonna say more about this when we finish this little brief overview. But the idea and the reason they use the flower as its metaphor is it says basically, what if our buildings were like a flower? What if they were like a plant? A plant uses only the available solar currency that falls on it. It doesn't reach back into ancient sunlight through fossil fuels. It uses only the available water that falls inside of its root zone. It doesn't reach down into ancient aquifers, dinosaur water, I've heard some people refer to it. It doesn't change the, the uh, balance in terms of waste. In fact, if you think about waste, and we're gonna talk about this, waste is really a human construct because in nature, everything is becoming something. Waste is really a human invention. This idea of cradle to grave is something that we've created. In nature, everything is becoming something. So it really challenges us to rethink just about everything. So this is the audit report that we received on the Burbeck at Beacon Springs Farm Project. And there again, you can see that flower. Uh, there's Amanda, point of contact, and it received its certification on uh, October of 2017. We're gonna talk a little bit about some of the specifications, but this is the report card that we had received. And there's certain transects and different qualifications depending on where the project is that ask us to focus on certain things and not other things. This is an aerial view from the east, northeast of Burbeck at Beacon Springs. To the left, you see the primary dwelling. To the right, there's a garage and farm operations building. The home is on, sitting on 15 acres and its total condition space of the main home is 4,970 square feet. Its actual living space is about 2,500, but the whole house, the whole, um, whole everything enclosed is conditioned. And then we also have the conditioned garage barn area. We're gonna go more into this when we break out into the wall sections, but the R values for the, um, the assembly is the R30 for the slab, R30 for the basement wall, R48 for the above grade wall, and R68 for the roof and ceiling. The air leakage was 0 0.45 ACH 50. We actually generated a ResNet HERS score of minus 10. The EUI of this home is 7.1. With the PV, it's actually a negative 2.9. This home is generating surplus energy of roughly 4,000 kWh per year. And we're gonna talk about how we've created the systems to create that type of performance. Let's take a look at the aerial view of the house on the site. So you'll notice the house itself is off to the bottom and it's canted slightly facing to the Southwest. That was established to show the particular orientation that the homeowners wanted to view, looking into the area to the southwest of the property. The garage workshop area, barn and farm operations center, is to the north. And if you can notice, that's due east-west solar access. That was where we parked our 16 kW photovoltaic system which provided all the power for the house and including charging an electric vehicle with enough surplus power that they could actually charge a secondary vehicle as well. This is a view, aerial view floating above and you can see the panels there on the left-hand side. And one of the things you'll notice is there's this um, kind of intriguing tower. We're gonna to talk more about the tower because it was a fairly simple building form this is a view from the southeast looking up towards the building. So the building employed clear story windows to bring light deep into the, whoop, went a little too fast, deep into the body of the home. This is a view from the southwest. One of the things that you can see here on the southwest view is the 
amount of glazing to the south, as well as the TROM walls, T-R-O-M-B-E walls that we use, which are the blue glazed areas that are in between the vision glass. This is a view from the Northwest looking back towards the home and you can see that farm operations building. And then this is a view from the North Northeast. Let's take a look at the floor plan. Okay, this home was, it was essentially a rectangle, 78 feet by 30 feet. We were doing so many crazy things. We didn't have to do a crazy building <laughs> plan as well. Bob had his hands full, just trying to make sure everything was gonna happen. How it was basically organized was there was a circulation spine along the north that distributed into the spaces to the south. One of the challenges of the living building challenge is that all spaces need to have access to exterior views. And so we're gonna talk about how we did that for the kitchen area as well. So this is a view from the inside of the house looking back towards that entry tower. The entry tower was a part of the energy management system, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. It also formed an airlock. It's so funny, we do all these fancy uh, building science things and you know, everything old is new again, just simply having an airlock as a way to control the environment between inside and outside is a strategy that we employ on many, many, many homes. The next view is turning down the hallway, if we move from the entry area, let me see if I can annotate on screen. Oh, I can, great. So we were standing here looking at this space and now we're gonna be looking down the hall to the powder bath at the far northeast, northeast end of the home. Great. Whoops, going back. One of the interesting features of, <laughs> You got to have some technical issues or it's just not a Zoom meeting, right? All right. One of the interesting features of this home is this rusticated wall. Um, Tom and Marty's aspirations for this home was, although it was replete with state-of-the-art technology, they wanted to have this little sense of warmth and comfort. And they selected the, the Tuscan motif as the design inspiration for this home. If you notice the uh, sink base there, the vanity base, that's actually a, a log that came from Tom and Marty's old property that the homeowner carved out himself and created as the, uh, as the base for this, this um, the sink vessel. Many of the things that we're trying to do is utilize materials such as recycled materials. So what we usually talk about in our approach to energy management is approaching this from a three-step approach. Starting first, looking at conservation, second, looking at utilization, and last, looking at generation. And we invite our clients to consider that this is the sequence that you wanna take. It doesn't make any sense to put a bunch of solar on a house if you're losing a lot of energy. And it doesn't make any sense to buy fancy equipment if you're losing a lot of energy. So the basics that we take is lose as little energy as you can, use as little as energy as you can, and then make as much energy as you can. And it starts with conservation. Our conservation approach was the thermal envelope of our 30 slab, 30 basement walls, 48 above grade walls, and 68 roof. We ran this through, we were working with a HERS modeler as we were doing the energy modeling on this, and um, we were coming up with a HERS index that kind of caught our attention. It was a minus 11 HERS index. You guys probably recognize, recognize this gentleman. So we were spending a lot of time looking very carefully at the four control layers, water, air, vapor, and thermal. And what we essentially did is use Joe's perfect wall as the foundation for our assembly for the wall enclosure. So this is a little uh, section cut through the building. And we're going to zoom in on that now. It's a little fuzzy. I apologize for that. So our above, our below gray walls was poured concrete. And then we use rigid board insulation to the exterior. One of the things that we were wanting to do is to mine the thermal bridge that was coming up from the foundation. We had um, a, a productive conversation with Bob, our builder, 
And he was less than excited about putting insulation under the footing. And so we said, fine. So we were actually working with Building Science Corporation as consultants on this project, Kota Oeno, my personal hero. And uh, what we worked out with Kota was the possibility of bringing interior insulation up the interior wall. And by doing so, lengthening this thermal bridge. And for any of you who have had passive house training, you know that thermal bridging, there's, you know, we can either eliminate them or we can lengthen them to, to minimize their impact. And so we use that approach and so now we're setting our footing on solid bearing and we're bringing the insulation up the inside. We did use, if you notice that exterior brick veneer is sitting on a ledge of insulation. So we use insulation that was specifically certified to take the veneer weight because it was literally bearing on the insulation. But by doing that, we were able to create a continuous thermal envelope up the wall. We used a two by six stud cavity and we used exterior sheathing as our air control layer. And then we wrapped the house with two layers of insulation, offset and staggering the seams. Our roof assembly was structural insulated panels. In one section of the house, we had a, a timber construction. And for that area, we had a 12 inch SIP and then a five inch nail base on top of it. And then again, offset and staggering the seams and generating our air control layer at that location. On the other section of the house, we had wood truss assembly and we used that same exact technique, except we just use uh, nail base in both cases. We didn't need the strength of the SIP. These are details showing the specifics of those two different wall assemblies. This was kind of an interesting project because the clients wanted to use a stucco finish to give it the look of a traditional Tuscan home. And so we used the rain screen approach for both assemblies. And I was really excited because this, this was um, before Building Science Corporation came out with their stucco getting uh, building science report. And I was really pleased to see that what we did, which arguably was, uh, you know, it, it was a reach because we were basically generating a stucco finish on a rain screen assembly, ventilated and drained. So we, we put that system together and us, the clients and everyone are gonna sleep real well forever and ever knowing that we got a ventilated assembly. We also did hydrothermal analysis just to confirm the performance of the wall because we knew that building science was on our side and we had good reason to believe it was gonna perform but you know, in God we trust, all others bring data, as the saying goes. And so we ran that analysis and we were excited to see how we were trending towards drying. And then this is the roof assembly. Again, as we mentioned, we had two different assemblies, one over the trust roof area, which is to the left, and the other over the timber frame area, which was to the right. Uh, both of these assemblies were essentially the same. So now we're gonna move from that area back into the main body of the house. So as we have got the conservation piece underhand, we now look to generation. And we had a perfect site to take advantage of passive thermal energy. And what we did is we put down two and a half inches of concrete on top of a wood open, open truss, parallel cord truss floor. And that became our, our kind of our mass and glass approach to this project. And what we like to do is uh, whenever we can hook our wagon to the sun because the sun doesn't send a bill, right? You guys all know that. And so using uh, tuned overhangs and working with the energy modeling and NREL's calculations, we were able to tune our overhangs so that the sun deeply penetrates into the space in the wintertime and is blocked off in the summertime. And it's always fun when our clients, you know, we always encourage them, you know, run out and take a picture of the sun shadow on June 21. And they're always amazed. It's like, it comes down right to the bottom of the windowsills. And I say, it's as if it was planned. Isn't this exciting? So this is a view. And uh, I should also mention that our four-legged family members enjoy that thermal energy as well. Um, the proof in the pudding came when we recently went through what was called the polar vortex here in the Midwest where we had temperatures as low as minus 16 degrees. This is like, you know, I've got buddies up in Minnesota 
And that's what they're used to. We're not typically used to that. But I'll never forget this. Um, Tom and Marty, they, um, they sent me this picture. Their, their set point inside was 68 degrees. It was three degrees outside. And they actually cracked the window because it was getting a little too warm inside. So while the rest of us were scrambling to try to stay warm, battening down all the hatches, they had a nice fresh breeze of, of, of crisp Michigan winter air coming in to their home. So it, it, this was like, <laughs> this is you know why we do this work team, everyone on this meeting, this is why we do this work. All right, so now we're heading, so we were in that main space and now we're gonna head over to, to Marty's study. This is one of the spaces on the side of the home. But before we do that, I wanna spend a little time talking about this tower. So we are very much interested in passive heating, obviously, but we also wanted to introduce passive cooling. And so this tower, uh, besides the fact that every house should have a tower, right? I mean, who doesn't want a tower? This house, this tower was designed as part of the mechanical system. The floor, the, the intermediate floors in the upper level floor was designed as a grate. We worked with the University of Michigan Blue Lab at the College of Architecture and Engineering. And we had them do hydro, uh, pardon me, computational fluid dynamic studies. We, we did wind rose studies of the site. And what we established was the optimal rotation, orientation and height of the tower. And how the tower functioned was this. When we wanted to naturally ventilate the home, we would open up the windward windows on the southwest of the home on all floors. Then on the tower, we would open up the windward and the leeward windows. The warm air would be drawn up into the tower through natural convection, but we also had the advantage of the wind coming through the tower at the top, kind of like blowing over the top of a straw, creating a venturi effect. What we learned from this study is that we were actually getting more CFM movement through natural means using the venturi effect and thermal siphoning than we could with the mechanical system on full. And this was with no added energy whatsoever. So now we're gonna move over to the far side of the house. This is the kitchen. And what we had talked about with the living building challenge was the necessity for all interior spaces to have access to natural light. So what we did with the kitchen sink is we positioned it in such a fashion that it was, had a window that looked out the window beyond that gave them that access to natural light. It was fun and it worked out really, really nicely. And I encourage you to borrow that if you're doing some design work yourself. All the appliances obviously were Energy Star. This is an all electric home. Uh, one of the usual pushbacks we usually get from our clients is if we're going to an induction type cooktop, it's like, hey, I'm, 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 I'm used to cooking with gas. Well, we share with them that it's 80% more efficient than gas. And there's been numerous studies showing that particulates from gas uh, ranges are, are causing um, significant compromises to indoor air quality and in asthma. And there's a great view showing the view through the window to the window beyond. And it happens to line up with the window on the, on the garage carport too. It's as if it was planned. <laughs> Moving on here to Tom and Marty's um, far side of the house. This is Marty's study. This is a view into the bedroom. To the right hand side of that, or to the left hand side of that window, you could see the trom walls. And these are the exterior trom walls. We have three series of them one, two, three, and three stacked here. These were quite a challenge to create. These are how we are generating the passive energy from the trauma solar collection. So how this works is the sun energy comes through the exterior glass. It hits a selective surface that was mounted to the exterior face of the masonry wall. In this case, it was poured concrete. That selective surface it's, accepts 95% of the energy and only lets 5% of the energy re-radiate back out. 
So that heat energy slowly builds up in that wall so that when the sun is down, that heat energy is making its way into the house. And Tom has had some fun with a infrared thermometer shining it on the wall and had temperatures upwards of 100 and 110 degrees inside the wall when it's been below zero degrees outside. And the neat thing about them is there's no moving parts. We're now gonna head over to the far northwest corner of the house where we have the bathroom. And one of the things about the uh, project is we wanted to design this in such a fashion that could serve them throughout their lives. And so the shower was designed with a partition that could be removed, providing roll across access into the future. So from here, we're gonna move down to the lower level. So this is essentially a, a walkout ranch. We're coming down into the main space. And what we wanna talk a little bit here is about the water harvesting. Part of the living building challenge imperative is that we are net positive water. And so this was one of the first projects that we worked on that looked at actually collecting rainwater and using it for potable purposes. So we had three 2,500 gallon cisterns that were buried to the southwest of the home. These collect roof water that will provide three months of water supply when full, if the sky was to shut off. The issue we ran into is the local jurisdiction wouldn't allow us to use that water for any type of domestic purposes except for exterior irrigation. And so we were joking that uh, Tom and Marty's plants were actually drinking better water than Tom and Marty were. Now we're gonna to move to the mechanical systems. So this project had a ground source heat pump, geothermal system, and it was a four ton unit. We have in-floor radiant heating, and then we have forced air heating for and cooling for the shoulder seasons. And the ground source heat pump geothermal system is also providing makeup hot water for the hot water system. This, the, the idea here was to do the in-floor heat as its primary heating source. Now we have had four seasons now of them operating the home. And as many of you know, when you have in-floor heating, we have issues with the shoulder seasons. That's why we installed the forced air heating and cooling system, system to take advantage of that potential to rapidly change the temperature. Now, one of the things that was unique about this project, and Bob will probably second this thought, is we built a sub-basement. So by that, I mean, we had the main level, the basement, and then we built a basement underneath that. And the reason we did that, you can see it in this drawing, is one of the other imperatives of the living building challenge is net zero waste. This was the first project that we have designed that used a centralized composting system. And because we had plumbing groups on the lower level, we had to have them drain to a lower space. And so that's what we did with this plumbing pit. Here is a picture of the plumbing pit. You can see our water purification system what we also did is we petitioned the local jurisdiction to use a unit called an aquatron. An aquatron is a three chamber rotating centralized composting unit that was gonna collect all of the waste from the house. We have plumbed all of the fixture groups with two or actually three different lines that come to this plumbing pit. One black, one yellow and one gray. And you can imagine what the black and the yellow are, right? So we have designed this house to use a toilet called a dubleton, D-U-B-L-E-T-O-N. And what these do is these separate at the source, the liquid from the solid waste. The solid waste would come down to the main plumbing pit. It would be collected and compost. The yellow would be diverted to an exterior holding tank where it would be diluted one parts to 10 and it would be used for in root fertilization of the plant orchard, and the gray water would be distributed in the same fashion. So the idea here was that this building 
was going to be actually generating nutrients for the local environment. As I mentioned earlier, the only thing that we can do with the water that we're harvesting from the skies at Burbeck for Beacon Springs is water the exterior plants. We use a structured plumbing system for this house to do a closed loop recirculation and we had two loops. Uh, here, here's an interesting story. So we had two loops for the circulation of the plumbing and we discovered that it, it wasn't performing as intended. Well, apparently the manifolds got changed and so we made a, made a quick switch on the manifolds and everything was working out beautifully. Um, lastly, we have a root cellar underneath the tower to store produce. And then at the far end of the house, we have our solar edge inverters. The solar panels are entirely located on top of the garage outbuilding barn. And they are, as I mentioned, charging not only the house, but also providing power for their electric vehicle. This is their average solar electricity distribution from inception until current. And this is showing the net positive versus net negative. What we are looking at is on average over the course of the last three years of roughly 3,500 kWh per year positive energy. So they got plugged into the solar program before Michigan changed its net metering. And so for the next 10 years, they'll be um, accruing, po accumulating positive balances on their, on their energy um, ledger. So just to finish this up, one of the things that was interesting about this living building challenge is it really asked us to kind of reconsider normal. And it's kind of interesting because this recent coronavirus event that we've had has given us a chance to reconsider what is normal. So this is LA before the lockdown, right? This is what normal looks like. This is what possible looks like. This is LA after the lockdown. One of the ideas with this living building challenge is really leaning us towards what might be possible. And it's much, much more than just energy as you've seen with some of this, this brief overview. But we have an opportunity here. You know, we're really facing some significant challenges and arguably this is our greatest potential to make the greatest change. So that's a brief overview of this Burbank at Beacon Springs project. I'm gonna finish the PowerPoint and then have Amanda share a little bit about the challenges that she faced. All right. Um, so I came onto the project. I was um, an initial member of the project. My um, colleague at the time I was working for a company out of Grand Rapids called Catalyst Partners. Um, my colleague there, um, Eric Doyle, took the project through design and kicked off um, many of the pedals, including um, site and uh, equity and beauty and and got the, the big three, the water and energy and materials started. Um, and then he handed off the project to me when we uh, finished up CDs and moved on into construction. Um, fortunately for, for Bob and I and vetting materials uh, into construction, Michael loves to have things be perfect. And so we had about a year of grace in there in order to get everything in order to break ground. Um, as, as Bob mentioned early on, um, the certification program is aptly named being the Living Building Challenge. We had uh, no shortage of challenges along the way. Um, one of them just being getting up and out of the ground. There was a major um, rainstorm early on in the summer when he was breaking ground. And so that gave us a little bit of extra time to to end up vetting over 900 different products for this project. Um, ultimately, almost 600 of them were approved for use uh, in the home. Um, and uh, some of you have mentioned challenges. I'm kind of reading the comments along the way um, regarding red list uh, challenges with uh, styrofoam. Obviously that's one of the red list items. Um, and just for a quick, overview for anybody, anybody that's not um, familiar with the red list, what's on there are things like asbestos, cadmium, um, lead, halogenated flame retardants, 
Um, there's about 20 categories and over 800 derivatives within those categories that a uh, home that registers now for the program cannot have any of those products uh, within the home. Um, and so Bob sent me everything he put into that house um, and we were connected at the hip, um, at least virtually through the entire process so that we knew every single thing um, that went into the house was approved for use. Um, there were definitely some um, exemptions provided in order to ensure that the project could be successful and achieve certification. One of those um, was the insulation. Uh, we had to pursue an exemption for that um, in order to meet the performance requirements that um, we had to achieve to be net zero from an energy perspective. Um, and, and a lot of that also came with advocacy. Michael mentioned that early on um, part of this program is to advocate to push the building industry forward. Um, and so as part of this project, we wrote to over 100 different CEOs and uh, sustainability leaders within the manufacturing industry to either share the information and be transparent um, and also to remove any of the red list materials from their products so that they can be used uh, freely on a uh, living building project and any other project that wants to use red list approved pro products. Um, and so that was a really fulfilling part of this, even through all the challenges. There, there was a lot to learn and a lot to, um, was, it was a, a piece that was bigger than just the project itself, was, was pushing the industry to do better. Um, so that ultimately one day we'll have like a nutrition label for our products um, and be able to know exactly what's in them without having to uh, send so many letters and contact so many individuals. Um, I have a question I see. Go ahead. I just wanted to add, it's so funny that you're saying a nutrition label for our products. I, I kid sometimes and I tell our clients, uh, up until now, the only parameters that we had in selecting products was, do you like it? Can you afford it? And can we get it? We had forgotten that fourth one, which is, will it kill you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so that obviously is a big thing. Somebody mentioned indoor air quality monitors um, in the comments, yes. Um, so that was, we, we tested twice in the home. Um, you have to test right after construction as well as at that one year mark to ensure that you're um, maintaining quality air within the home for, for the owners and, and any guests that might be coming into the home. And there's also daily monitors that are tied to a smartphone so that they can always see what the uh, quality of the air is. Um, and let's see, some other challenges uh, were, um, let's see, Michael mentioned the composting of toilets. We also had to do a lot of advocacy there. Um, and- Can I speak to that for a second? Yeah, go ahead. So on the composting toilet, um, Bob will remember this. We met with the local jurisdiction and we had the actual manufacturer from Aquatron live from Sweden this was before Zoom. This was, this was before virtual meetings. It was 2 a.m. in the morning for them. And they joined us in a projection presenting this to the local jurisdiction, but uh, they opted not to, not to take the, there is a provision in the code, um, code or equal. And they opted not to take that provision. So we went ahead and Tom and Marty went ahead and they plumbed the house We've designed it. This Aquatron unit comes apart into three sections and we've created a path for it to come into the house. So even though we were not able to use that, in this house we have a conventional um, septic system, which is considered a closed loop ecology because they're harvesting their own water, more or less filtered by the earth. But Tom and Marty wanted to really raise the bar and show what was possible. And so their, their house is ready to go for the minute that that regulation changes and we can do that composting toilet. Um, some other successes to mention on uh, the material side with, with Bob and his team uh, working so diligently to first reduce the materials that came on site and then either divert or recycle any remaining construction materials, we were able to achieve 94% waste diversion 
for the project. Um, that also has to go into ownership as well. So the um, Tom and Marty do their best to reduce any waste and products that they're bringing into the home so that they don't create create waste that goes to landfill and they're doing a lot of composting on site with their um, landscaping and, and the, the acreage that they have. Um, as far as the impact from a carbon footprint perspective goes, somebody mentioned building new versus doing a remodel. Um, we did have to do a calculation that looked at what was that impact of the entire project start to finish, even any travel that went into it, um, the type of materials that were used for the home. Um, and we did purchase in perpetuity, uh, I shouldn't say we, the owners purchased in perpetuity, uh, 113 acres of land to help offset uh, the impact of building a new construction home. Um, and in addition to that, 365 uh, total CO2 offsets were purchased. Um, so the equivalent about you know, planting 2000 trees. Um, so everything was taken into consideration from the perspective of not only um, upfront impact and what went into the home, but long-term impact as well. Um, yes, you did see a wood burning fireplace in the home. Um, that uh, is part of the living building challenge based on where you are located. If you're within an urban area, you or even the surrounding um, areas, um, if you're in a suburban area, you cannot have a, a wood burning fireplace. You have to be in a rural area um, and they, at least based on the V2.1 uh, version of the Living Building Challenge, it was allowed. Um, so that's why you, you do see that in the home. Um, and then let's see, I'm just looking over my notes a little bit here to make sure. Um, it was kind of fun to uh, walk through the project uh, photos again that Michael was showing because it it brought back some memories of some of the materials that we vetted. And again, similarly to bringing anything into the home, um, we first looked at what could we find from the area that was had already had a life somewhere and give it a new life. That was the easiest way to meet Red List uh, compliance was, was giving something a new life. And so the owners did a lot of looking around um, resale shops in the area. Uh, the wood planks that you saw in the ceiling of the living room that uh, came from a barn in Ohio. Um, Actually, I think oh, that was a schoolhouse in Ohio. Schoolhouse. 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 Not, yes. Floorboards from a schoolhouse. Um, a lot of the lighting was purchased uh, from uh, secondhand nature. Um, a fun little story about the copper sinks that you saw. Everybody loves their Moscow mules. And so Jim Beam was producing a lot of the, you know, the copper mule mugs that um, everybody drinks their mules out of. And so because of that and the rigorous testing from an FDA perspective um, and uh, human consumption perspective, uh, perspective, they had the testing requirements that we needed for that particular copper. And those things are made from the same copper um, that was supplying Jim Beam um, with their mule mugs. And um, a couple other, um, the bathtub that you saw as well was also a salvaged item and lovingly restored um, by the homeowners. Um, and even down to their outside um, kind of mud wash bin that they have, there's a door that comes in from the lower level um, and they put a, a big wash bin and old concrete laundry tub out there to wash up before they come in the home. But it was found on the side of the road in Ann Arbor. Um, and so that was one of the, the um, easiest ways to fulfill the challenge from a material perspective was finding something that had already had a life and give it a new one um, rather than trying to pursue vetting, um, especially electronics, any sort of equipment that had multi-components um, those were the biggest challenge to be able to pull apart um, wiring. We all know UL ejected wiring um, often has flame retardants in it. And uh, to find something that would pass uh, the red list in order to be able to bring it in the home um, was another one of our big challenges. Um, but working with Michael and Bob, we, we made it work. It was constant communication 
uh, between the three of us during construction. And with that, I can hand it over to Bob to talk about the, the actual construction process. All right, thank you. Well done uh, on both of your parts, Michael and Amanda. Uh, truly the, the milestone of my career, I've been a builder almost 23 years uh, after a 21 year career at General Motors at Buick and uh, probably as intense and involved as anything I've ever been involved with, certainly from a building standpoint. Uh, it's also uh, represented almost 25% time-wise of my entire building career uh, because I was involved from day one when Tom and I walked up the two track to see where the potential site might be. And uh, we agreed that day, or he said he'd like to have me on the team and Michael supported that, thank you very much. Um, so I've been there from day one, attended most of the key meetings along the way. and as Amanda said, was involved with all the vetting and planning. Um, you know, unlike a traditional house where we just go do it, you know, we, we think we do it well. I call ourselves, or we call ourselves Michigan's greenest builder because of our lead history in this project and so forth. So rather than just doing it the way we want to, we clearly had to be uh, loyal to the plans, the direction, and the requirements of uh, uh, living building challenge, as Tom said early on, Michael said earlier, you know, it's, it's either do it all and get it certified or, or don't do it. So there wasn't any option and there was no option to fail. Uh, so one of my greatest roles, I think, was being a teacher and a cheerleader, maybe a psychologist at times. And, uh, you know, not only and also being the liaison with a homeowner, because Tom and Marty are very interested, uh, anal, detailed, whatever you want to call them. So it wasn't like we were doing a lot of things they didn't know about or that the rest of the team wasn't aware of. So it wasn't us just going and building a house. It was us representing the whole team and getting it done. And, and you know, certainly a lot of materials, floor, floor trusses, joists, all those kind of things are traditional. But a lot of the ways it went together and certainly attention to detail was way over and above anything we've ever done before. So all of that said, in the material requirements, particularly when you're buying these, you know, the S, let's see, SPF, what the heck is a lumber, S, so SF, FSC lumber, certified lumber, sorry. Um, you go buy that stuff, first you can't hardly find a source for it. All of our lumber for that house came from Grand Rapids, which is two and a half hours away. And then when you buy it, it's twice the price of anything you normally pay. So uh, being the builder, one of our biggest challenges always, no matter what house we're doing, is trying to keep costs under control. Uh, and I'm not going to get into numbers at the homeowner's wishes, but, you know, we're at least double what you might normally spend, uh, plan to spend for a house like that. So that, I think, is one of the biggest challenges um, most of you are aware in, in the green building area. You know, you start talking about net zero, it's expensive. you got to spend extra money. And uh, material and labor costs have continued to skyrocket. skyrocket. They're higher than we've ever seen before. And then you add the complexities of the green building on top of it. When people are already, in most cases, past what budget they want to spend, that was a real challenge. Uh, the only thing that saved our grace here is, uh, first, of all, first of all, we had a cost plus agreement with the con with the customer, which was a saving grace. But they were willing to foot the bill, and uh, their budget went way, way, way over where they wanted to be, and probably then some. And then you add on uh, the cost for Amanda Services and her company and the architectural services. The cost is a big deal. For most people, it's, you know, there's no way you're going to do it. And unfortunately, in a thing like this, I don't think in, in how many years you could never justify the cost. Uh, but it really was driven by the fact that the client wanted to do it. We all wanted to show the building community what's possible and, and that we could get it done. Um, so I'll stop beating the horse on the cost. But in many building projects, that's the single biggest challenge. Even, even regular houses don't have all the certification as a challenge. So, um, but we had to be constantly monitoring. I mean, you didn't go a day where you didn't go visit between myself, my partner, and uh, our incredible foreman, Roy. Um, but we were always there watching. Um, nobody could smoke on site. Uh, there was no trash, no McDonald's bags left on site. Uh, we had one small trailer that we kept there, and every tra everything that did get recycled went in that trailer, and when it was full, we'd take it and drop it off at the recycle station and come back for some more. But we really did uh, a, an extreme effort to minimize the waste, which worked really well. Um, and everybody, even though there was like, what, Michael, 56 pages on that uh, construction document or something like that, it, it was extensive. It was extensive. 
and, and even page you saw on some of the examples earlier, the details on those pages were extreme. So it, it really took a lot of paying attention to detail or you could easily miss something or screw something up. So I commend my team for that. Um, and another thing that was interesting about the project was we built the garage first. So we actually used that as a staging area, put some temporary heat in there. So working through the winter, we had a place to use it as an office and lay out the blueprints and materials and things. So clearly, uh, no question, that was the most challenging project of my career, uh, probably any builder's career, I would say. And I also take a lot of, we also, my team, we take a lot of credit because most builders would never have been able to pull this off. I mean, it was overwhelming the amount of stuff we had to deal with and the details. And then you had the complexity of the product vetting and all the time back and forth with Amanda. And um, it was just over, over the charts. I mean, off the charts in terms of complexity. And so anyway, we take a lot of pride in being able to pull this off and make it happen. And on top of that, being very close friends with Tom and Marty, but we were out, we eat dinner at their house now and then, as I know Michael and Cindy do, and we took them boating this summer, so we've become quite great friends with them, and that's been a real uh, honor to be in that home, see them enjoying it. I was just there a few weeks ago, and lots of dogs running in and out, and it's it's just been a lifetime experience that you couldn't replace. So with that, I'll kind of let it go. I'm happy to entertain any questions. I'm kind of curious, Bob, uh, are there aspects of this project that could be boiled down to either materials or techniques that you will use on more everyday projects that you do? Like what oh, are some of the takeaways that, that you feel like you will absolutely be incorporating into your work going forward? Oh, absolutely, Kylie. Uh, one of the key ones would be the, uh, the structure as far as the air sealing and the uh, insulation in different places, those values. I mean, we've always known a lot about a lot of those things and you're probably familiar with EEBA, uh, EBA, Energy, Envir Energy and Environmental Builders Alliance. Well, we've been with them for 20 plus years. So we've known a lot about that, but by really paying attention to the details and some of the sequence of structure, uh, we, we offer those kind of things to other clients going forward. And we always tell them, we'll give them a smorgasbord of options and then they can pick what makes the most sense for themselves or their goals or their budget. But uh, clear, clearly a lot of learning from this and, and we do take that forward. Yeah, there are people in the chat saying, you know, you're, you're bringing the boat up, bringing the bottom up, you know, by doing this and, and people have to do these kind of projects to bring some of this to, to the rest of us, right? And so those one-off projects are always gonna be hard, but it brings something to the table, you know, and probably, um, I don't know if you guys have a list now of all the products that you used in there that are, are acceptable on the red list. So if you did another living building challenge, you can at least start with a few things that hopefully, you know, uh, are approved. Because I, I, Amanda, it sounds like you took a considerable amount of time following up with a lot of people to find out what exactly is is in these. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, that improvement, just people telling you what's in the product is is huge. So. Yeah, we were we were pioneers, uh, Amanda. Most of this was for the first time. We got a little, some information from the other living building uh, challenge home out on the west coast, but most of it was homegrown here, and we we're also willing to share that. Yeah, and part what, of the relationship too with ILFI is that we we actually did share our material list back with them for um, open source anybody can can take a look and see at the the red list items that we did use and that yeah ilfi has a program called declare which has vetted materials that meet red list certification and emily just like you said with every passing project and every new opportunity that list keeps growing and growing and growing and, and this was a one of the small successes of many successes that this, this project enjoyed was Amanda's efforts at one point in time, you may have noticed on the construction documents, we were showing clay tile for the roof. This was in keeping with the Tuscan theme. That was until the, the budget <laughs> reared its ugly head. And so that quickly became standing sea metal, which was a step down, believe it or not, from the, the clay tile. But we were looking at a particular clay tile that Ludoichi clay tile made and Amanda in her persistence lobbying them, they had one of the 
ingredients in the tile that we were considering was cadmium. And in her lobbying and making them aware of this, they voluntarily changed the formulation of their product to eliminate cadmium. Remember how we said at the beginning of this presentation, it's a philosophy, it's an advocacy, and then it's a certification program. So consider that mission accomplished. Um, unfortunately, we ended up not using their product because, because of the cost, but they've now opened up an entire market. And the whole idea of Living Building Challenge is really rethinking how we create space and the materials and products and the way that we do that. So again, hats off to Amanda for just a job extremely well done. Yeah, she was a yeoman. I'll tell you what, I can't give her enough credit. We never would have pulled it off without you, Amanda, <laughs> ever. Thank you. You folks um, mentioned the first the first uh, living building, residential living building challenge project. Uh, Al Tozer is the designer there. And that is in, uh, remind me of the location, Bend. Desert Rain. Bend. Desert Rain in Bend, in Oregon. Oregon, right. Um, so how much, and that was, what, 15 years ago, I think, that that was built. So how much of what they pioneered was applicable for your project? Because you mentioned that you were working under uh, Living Building Challenge version 2.1, and now we're up to 3.0 or 3.0. So um, how, you know, these are these projects are few and far between, right? <laughs> so all of the vetting that Amanda did, uh, is it going to be another 15, 20 years before somebody's looking at that list? Um, I guess, how much information were you able to pull from the existing project? Um, was that was that helpful? Well, um, it was helpful um, I, from a percentage wise to say what we were able to glean from that. I'd just be, you know, throwing a dart at the wall in the dark. Um, but part of the challenge with using um, their materials list is location. Sure. So one of the things with Living Building Challenge is it's very place-based, including where you're sourcing your materials. It's not only the red list, but you also have to be conscious how far away that you're sourcing those materials. And so the heavier they are, the closer to the project site you have to source them. Um, and so that was really the biggest challenge um, of being able to utilize their list. Um, but some things like the rainwater system um, was similar system to the um, to ILFI's headquarters um, in, in Washington. And so we were able to source some things depending on where they fell within like a CSI uh, division um, in section. One other interesting item I forgot was we couldn't buy interior trim doors, moldings, et cetera, from somewhere else because it would have interrupted the chain of FSC certification. So we bought the raw material lumber and different thicknesses and so forth that was FSC certified, had it delivered to the site so we could control the shipping and where it came from and so forth. And then we had a carpenter who literally built all the interior products, whether it be kitchen cabinets, uh, interior doors, in, interior trim moldings, every single piece of that was built on site. We set up a shop in the garage. So that was an interesting challenge for sure. Not to mention the other, I did it, but. I wanted to just jump in here and share that another one of the benefits of having uh, Tom and Barbara, who were the owners of Desert Rain, uh, when we were in the middle of this project, Tom and Marty Burbeck and, and I went out to the Isla Fi conference in Seattle. And Tom and Barbara were there. And so we had lunch with them. And we established a close relationship with them, which continued throughout the project. And that was a really good thing because I'm sure Amanda and Bob remember there were several moments of truth, let's just call it, in the project where I remember sitting down with Tom and Marty at Bell's Cafe and Tom had this thousand yard stare because this, I mean, this really is a challenge. And I think he was just like, there were several moments when he came close to the edge and, and but he persevered, he stayed on. And I think uh, having another project out in front of them made that path in the wood a little easier to achieve. And now them make someone else's path a little bit easier each one builds momentum 
and it's it's the it's the fall out it's the it's the collateral benefits that come from these projects and like bob has said he's now incorporating many of the things that he's learning in the project that he's doing and certainly for us i mean we're actually talking to someone about doing an lbc project in reno nevada right now a remodeling project so it, you just never know how you know how the impact is going to be michael was there that the first time you've done i'm sorry but there have been projects um, that have used the, say, the materials list from our project um, and, and have used it um, in good faith because they want to use it, but not actually pursue certification. So even though, you know, I don't think it'll be 20 years before another project is certified, um, but, you know, that time frame is, is shrinking. But I do know that it's being used even today. Um, just, you know, in the spirit of using that list uh, to do more good, um, but not fully pursuing certification. Uh, one interesting thing, thing to me is in my 23 year career, uh, when I first started and went to the EBA events, you know, a lot of the things today that are mainstream, uh, lower door testing, uh, better insulation in the walls and windows, etc. I mean, a lot of that stuff was unknown or not used very widely in those days. And now even with the Pulteys of the world and so forth, we've come a long way, clearly not far enough, but it's been encouraging to see the progress. And I see people talking about raised energy heel trusses and 20 years ago, they'd never heard of them before. So it, it, it is encouraging to me and uh, probably beyond my lifetime, it'll keep going, but uh, it's nice to be a part of that and promote it. Yeah, no, or I, I have a bunch of questions. Uh, first of all, just thank you for presenting Thing is in our project and um, I appreciate all your time. Uh, we we had a bunch of questions about your trome wall and then um, I was also curious about the airlock entry like just as part of my sales pitch um, it's often or includes that, that um, a lot of experiments happened in the 70s and 80s that were good ideas but we gradually realized that air tightness and, and insulation and good windows matter more and so one of the things that often gets cut are things like trome walls and airlock entries. So I'm curious how you found that an airlock entry in an airtight house is worthwhile and then what, what the what the impact of the trome wall is on the overall energy performance of the house. Yeah, the, the first of all, addressing the airlock entry, what's, what's so neat about that, Mike, is you can have an airtight house, but then you put something in it called a door and you come in and out of that door. So many of the technologies that we have kind of abandoned, indigenous technologies, I mean, were there for a reason. When we didn't have airtight houses, we still had apertures and porosity in the home. And as it turns out, I would like to say that it was a foresight, but they make awesome decontamination zones too, if you should happen to have a global pandemic, uh, you know, just in case. So it's, it's provided other benefits as well. And in that case, it was also for us an opportunity to generate that basically it was a vertical duct that looked like a tower. So it was part of the mechanical system. So we can engage that or decouple that by using those doors. So it did multiple things. Um, the trauma wall uh, component was, that was the first time we'd ever done it. We'd actually worked with a local um, ar architectural colleague who did a lot of work in solar back in the seventies and um, drawn a blank on his name, Amanda, help me. Oh gosh, Wayne, Wayne, Wayne Apple. Apple. Yes. yes, and um, him, and then also the former dean of the College of Architecture at the University of Michigan uh, was a big advocate for you know kind of that mass situation. And so, what we did is we incorporated it in on the south side. And one of the things that we were concerned about was that you you can't turn them off, right? So when they're when they're generating heat, they're generating heat. And we were able to shade the upper band with the roof overhang. And we had designed a balcony or terrace, if you will, that would have shaded the lower ones. But budget being what budget is, that got cut off. And so we were really concerned about how they were gonna perform in the summertime. But what ends up happening is the angle of incidence from the solar radiation in the summer is such that the preponderance of the energy doesn't actually make its way into the Tron wall. And so they have performed Absolutely beautifully. Uh, that was a absolute challenge too for Bob to build. Bob, do you want to share with uh, the team about building that? 
Yeah, it was quite interesting. Of course, it required coordination with your uh, concrete contractor and the uh, concrete supplier and a pump truck and all those kind of things. We could have built it out of uh, CMU block units and filled them, but we elected to frame it up and pour it. Of course, I remember the first time we poured it, one of the forms blew out in the basement. We had about two yards of concrete on the floor, but you know, that's what happens when you sign up to be a builder. Um, all in a day's work. Yeah, so we learned quickly that even though we know about hydraulic pressure, we had to extra reinforce those forms because they got, I don't know, what was the one, Michael, 18 or 20 foot tall, I think, where the three big windows are top to bottom. At the so back that, side of the house, yeah. So it was full of reinforcing steel and so forth. Um, but like everything else, you know, then when you build it, you figure it out. So we figured out how to properly form it and reinforce it and everything, and then we poured it and uh, one of the biggest challenges beyond that was the selective surface, getting that to look just right. And we had to sand, or sand grind, scrape, whatever else you want, the concrete walls, be, even though they were poured in forms before we put the selective surface on there. So we finally got her done, but it was uh, not for the faint of heart. There might be easier ways. Maybe, maybe we didn't do it the easiest way, but we got her done. And it's fun to put your hand on the wall, too, and feel that heat in the wintertime. Oh, I'm sure. I'm in, sure. The, in the offset of that, there were a lot of questions about the tower. Did it work the way that you wanted it to? Uh, oh would it gosh, work yes. if it was a different shape? Um, well, yeah. So um, this is a fun story. So we have these uh, tours of houses we call visible green home tours, where you get to get in, kick the tires, and really see what they're all about. And uh, on our more recent tour, we, we were standing in that space, and people's hair was being blown by the natural buoyancy and the Venturi effect, it, it absolutely works. In fact, Tom and Marty, I mean, arguably, their they, set points, their comfort set points are a little higher than, than most people. But the only time that they turn on their air conditioners when we had this visible green home tour at the end of it, because they had so much latent heat in the house, they had it. So they're, they're using passive cooling as a way to cool this house, even in Michigan. I mean, it, it, it's, it, we're, we're thrilled at how it's turned out. Yeah, it works great. I've spent enough time there. There's no question it works well. Uh, Doug, um, I think it was Doug Horgan asked if there's LBC approved wiring. Did you have to do anything special to wire the house? This um, is probably so, an Amanda question, I bet. <laughs> yeah, there, there is some approved wiring. Um, depending on whether or not the, uh, the authority having jurisdiction will allow you to use it is a different story. Um, and so that was one of the challenges that we faced um, in the type of wiring we were putting into the home and really any of the electronics. Um, and so there, there was a lot of research done and ultimately it came down to pursuing one of the um, kind of exemption paths and there's the Rojas compliance that is out there. It's a, um, it's a standard or um, you know, a stamp of approval that's used a lot in the European markets. And so that was one of the strategies that we use in order to find a happy medium uh, with the, uh, the inspector to be able to um, use something that was at least doing, it had less of the things that we didn't want. It didn't fulfill red list to a T 100%. Um, but again, those are the things that we had to advocate for back to the manufacturer. Um, even the ones that we didn't um, purchase materials from, um, if we had to, um, you know, based on our research, we, you know, sourced it or per tried to, to gather, as, you know, five to 10 different sources in all of those manufacturers received letters from us to, you know, help us achieve this goal. And so ultimately the Rojas compliance was used quite a bit, um, both in wiring and really anything that had to do with electrical components. And part of that advocacy program is they want you to reach out to manufacturers and lobby for them. Mm -hmm. First of all, first of all, make them aware of it. I mean, many manufacturers even still to this day, maybe even some of the participants in this call or this Zoom meeting are not even familiar with the red list as a concept. So part of their idea is, hey, let's, like I said, do you like it? Can I get it? Can you afford it? Will it kill you? This is about adding that to the list in terms of our qualifications for materials. 
And so if you petition, was it Amanda, if you would have petitioned three different resources and if none agree. of them would meet compliance, then you would go with the least uh, egregious opportunity, but you would let them know that you're doing so under protest mm -hmm. because you really want to kind of keep the heat on, so to speak, right. that they would consider making these changes. Yep. There was a motto that we had to use quite a bit throughout the process, and it was not letting perfection impede progress. Um, and so when the goal of living building challenge is, you know, to have much more progress in the building industry, it's um, behind many of the other industries of the world um, from a efficiency perspective. And um, so it's really trying to push the envelope um, to do much more good. I hate to interrupt everybody too, but we're at the last five minutes and to keep in keeping with it's 730 and we could probably talk about this all night. I'd love to hear from each of you, you know, like what's your one takeaway from this project or doing this project that you would either share or do again or, or whatever. Amanda, do you want to lead us off? Um, sure. Um, this was in the, the, Tom and Marty have a website for the project. So that's another place where y'all can um, find some more information on the project and kind of see the, from their perspective, why they did it. Um, and so they had guest bloggers um, share their experience. And I, I wrote a blog at the end of the project and it was titled that, you know, hopefully it's not a once in a lifetime project. You know, it really truly was a once in a lifetime project. Um, but my goal is that it's not, um, and that we can do many more of these, um, you know, whether it's with the team on this call um, or other teams, um, but it, it's what we, you know, it's the work that we do and it's why we do it. Um, and the goal is that we can see many more of them rise. Uh, two key words and then a final thought. Uh, one is a commitment and the second one is collaboration. Uh, you would never get through a project like this or even a lead platinum for that matter without the commitment. And then that leads to the collaboration of the team. This would have never happened. At one point we had 17 people on the design team. So without all those folks and certainly the core group, it, it never would have happened. Um, finally, I think it's just that we need to take to heart what we've done and know that you can build really high performance homes that are not LEED certified or LBC or anything else. But I think in general, we've taken a lot of these uh, things that we learned in the knowledge and we apply it to other projects, whether there's a certification or not, which overall enhances the quality of the building we're doing. Well, what to say, as Bob has said, kind of career defining project, career defining opportunity, career defining relationships, career defining result. There, there is little that I think that I will look back on in my career that will compare to what we have achieved here with this project. And it all started with a declaration by Tom Burbeck when he was down in his basement and he declared we're going for full certification or nothing. And it reminds me of the declaration that Kennedy made when he said, we're gonna to go to the moon in 10 years. We didn't even have the math to go to the moon in 10 years. And the power of vision and declaration, and we were blessed, obviously, none of this would have happened without Tom and Marty Burbeck, who had the vision, the courage, the fortitude, the resources, and the dedication to make this happen. Uh, it's interesting because when we were at the Living Building Challenge Conference, Terrence Tempest Williams, who's a, a noted author, was there. And she has a great quote, which I basically live by. And that is that the eyes of the future are looking back upon us and they're praying for us to look beyond our own time. That's what this project is about. Well said. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing it. It's definitely inspirational for all of us. Um, for everybody who's still here, uh, Kylie will post uh, this up on the blog post. The replay will be up on YouTube. Um, and we, there are probably 30 more questions that were in the chat box that we just never got to. So I hope you guys will continue the conversation. I know I'd like to talk for another hour and a half and ask all of my questions as well. So um, thank you so much for sharing your time with us 
us tonight and this really special project um, because it's it's definitely and even for those of us who maybe never will get to do a living building challenge uh, project it's it makes every project better so thank you thanks, thanks for having us to participate it's been great to be with you guys thank you all what a pleasure thank you. happy new year to all <laughs> and so all good night <laughs> <laughs>